So yeah, I understand that God has these awesome plans for me and a purpose in everything, but honestly, I feel like I'm stuck where I am. I'm just having a hard time getting from where I am to where God wants me to be. I know He wants me to do great things. I'm just not sure how to get from where I am to where He wants me to be. Really? I'm not sure how to move forward. This word that God's laid on my heart, we're starting a new series today called Moving Forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's just something that God is burning in my heart. I truly believe as a church and as individuals, God is looking to move us forward from where we are to the next step, to the new season that he has in our life. I just sense that as a church that we're just at that place where God is saying, okay, it's, you're no longer where you are, but it's time to take another step. It's time to make progress. So I'm going to teach. I heard someone tell me recently that when I yell, I'm preaching, and when I'm calm, I'm teaching. So I'm going to preach and teach just a little bit, and you know how we do. I'm going to need for you guys to work with me as much as I'm working with you. Amen? Now, here's the thing about moving forward. A lot of people, you know, there's, there's that horrible world, word in the church world called backsliding. Anybody ever, ever heard that word before? Backsliding. Every, every time you do something you're not supposed to do, you backslide. Ah. <laughs> you you got to say it like that, too. You can't just say, you backslide. Ah. And, and whenever we, we, we think of the term backsliding or backslider, we think of someone who was following Christ and has stopped following Christ and they just back wilding out and losing their mind and, and we're looking at them and pointing and all this type of stuff. But this is one thing that I've discovered about life and I've discovered about our spiritual walk. There's no such thing as standing still. You're either making progress or you're sliding backwards. The Bible says you go from glory to glory to glory. And a lot of times we become complacent or we become satisfied because we feel that we've reached a certain place in our lives or, or we've reached a certain place of comfort or stability or, or whatever it is that we have set up for ourselves. So we begin to take the brakes off. We begin to relax. We begin to ease up a little bit, not knowing that God has more for us, that there's something else that he's called us to do, that there's so much more that he desires to reveal to us. So over these next four weeks, this series is really going to be a boot in your pants saying, hey, don't back up, don't slow down, don't calm down, push, press after all that God has for you. I remember when I graduated uh, way, way back when uh, from the University of Maryland College Park, greatest school in the universe. I <laughs> That was weak. But uh, I walked across the stage, I, I grabbed what I thought was my diploma. It was really a picture of the campus, and they said, when you pay your parking tickets, then you'll get your diploma. <laughs> but I got my diploma, I walked across, and I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm ready to retire. I'm done. I, I've done. I've put my work in. I did my four years. I'm ready to go move into a nursing home and just sit back and relax. I've accomplished all that I'm looking to accomplish. He said, boy, get out of my face. You better go get a job. What's wrong with you? You know, a lot of times when we reach these markers in our lives that we've been pushing for, that we've been pressing for, we're excited and you should celebrate about that. But the only thing is you should know that that's not where Christ has called me to stay. That's not where I'm supposed to set up shop. That's not where I'm supposed to build a tent and, and have a little time to myself. Keep pushing, keep pressing into all that God has for you. Somebody say amen. How many people would be honest enough in the house of God to admit that you have some type of case of road rage? <laughs> this ain't that type of church. Put your hand down. Don't be admitting the truth. We don't do that around here. Pretend like we got it all together. <laughs> I know because some of y'all cut me off. I'll be honest with you. I, I, when I'm driving, I, I don't get too upset. I don't use my horn too much. I'm not one of those people that's just wired and just yelling and flashing lights. Matter of fact, when people flash lights behind me, I'm the dude who steps on my brakes and says, oh, you want to go around me? Feel free to go around me. And then come to the side and I speed up a little bit more. But <laughs> that's serious. That's not good. Hey, I'm still alive. But I, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty calm when it comes to the road. I, I, I'm, I'm not too much a rush, not too much wound up or uptight, but there's one time that I just absolutely lose it. And that's when I'm driving in snow and I'm stuck and cannot move. Do you guys remember that, that, that snowstorm? I think it was about two years ago where it dropped right around five o'clock when everybody was going home. It took about 15 minutes from where I was to get home. It took me four hours to get home. Everywhere I turn, there's another car stuck. My car is spinning out and I'm telling you, I'm a grown man and I do not cry. But after about two hours, it's like, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I mean, I was just losing it. There is something about being stuck. Some of y'all looking at me like, he didn't really do that. You'd have done the same thing. There is something about being stuck, trying everything that you can, calling every number in your phone, turning down every street you can, but yet you can't seem to break out of that situation. You can't seem to break out of that circumstance. You can't seem to make any progress at all. And here's the thing about it. A lot of times, people are stuck so long that they begin to make excuses for why they're not making any progress. They begin to settle. They begin to say, you know, this is just a thorn in my flesh. This is just the cross that God has called me to bear. This is just a season that God has me in where he's building my character. And as soon as he's decided that my season is over, then he's going to release me. Do you know that God does have seasons, but a lot of times the reason that we're stuck has nothing to do with the fact that we're in a God season. It has to do with the fact that we're missing what God is trying to show us, what we need to do to release ourselves from where we are. You know, the children of Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt, it was a two-week trip from Egypt to the promised land. It should have only taken them. Their season was two weeks long. But yet for 40 years, they were stuck in the wilderness because they did not find out what God was trying to do in their lives. Are you stuck? Are you making progress? And let me just be really practical for you. Are you stuck financially? You know, a lot of times when we come to church, it's all about spiritually. But here's the thing. I believe everything is spiritual. I believe that if God is our king, if he says I've, he's, I've surrendered my life to God, that every single area of our lives should reflect the glory of God. Our finances should be progressing. Our relationships should be progressing. Our career should be progressing. Our spiritual life should be progressing. Every single area of our lives should be making progress because Christ says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I'm going to give you three things, and we're going to do four weeks of this, but just three things today of how to begin to move from the place that I'm in. And the first thing thing is this, to submit your will. You must submit your will. If you're taking notes, there's a, a, a following guide in your worship guide. Just open that up and write in, submit your will. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 9 says this, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. One thing Paul never hesitated to do is he never hesitated to admit that he was stuck, that he was in over his head, that before he met Christ, everything that he was doing was futile and had no purpose. Constantly throughout the word of God, Paul would say, I'm the chief of sinners. He said, it's a scam that I'm allowed into the kingdom of God, that God is using me. Paul took ownership of where he was in his life and realized that I can't move on without Christ stepping into my life. The first step is that we admit, you know what, I can't move. You know what, I'm stuck in my sin or I'm stuck in my situation or I'm stuck in this place in my life and I do not know how to get out, where to get out, where to go and how to move. I am stuck. You know, a lot of times when we get in situations, that snow storm I was telling you about, I actually had parked my car in my driveway after I'd gotten home and I, I moved in with my parents for two days because I didn't have any food, so I had to mooch off of them. But by the end of the storm, I went back to my house and the snowplow had piled snow all around my car. 
And I was digging for like two hours and then I would get in my car and, and reverse it and try to ram it and jump over the snow and get stuck again and I would dig out again. And for literally two hours, I'm digging my car out and fighting for my life and cannot get it out of that situation. A lot of times, people will fight in their own strength and do everything that they can to get themselves out of this situation instead of stepping back and saying, God, I'm stuck. God, I cannot move. God, I am in over my head. I'm not a lifeguard, but I heard lifeguards say that as soon as they see people drowning, they're, they're trained to jump in the water and to swim out to where they are. But they do not touch that person until the person stops flailing around. Because as long as the person is trying to save themselves, the lifeguard is of no use to them. When we submit ourselves to God, when we submit our lives to God, we say, God, I can't move further. I can't get out of this situation. I can't fix this jam that I'm in. I need you to set me free. I need you to come into my life. I need you to bring progress in this area that I've toiled at, that I've pushed at, that I've done everything that I can do. God, I am stuck. Paul constantly said, he said, you don't realize I was the chief of sinners. I was, I, was, I was not worthy of anything that God had for me. And because of that, God was able to step in and to pick him up from the situation that he was in. Turn with me really quickly. I want to show you something. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And it says this. Your page is still turning. It should be up on the screen. It says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. I don't know. Second? For godly sorrow, is that what it says? Somebody say help him, Lord. Is someone out there laughing at me? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. You got it? Do I have it? For godly sorrow, there we go, produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observing this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal and vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. 